Apple computer. I am going to share my screen. You know, Deb, I wanted to say I'm really glad we we're recording this morning because it is the inauguration. Um, You're right. There are yeah. lots of things who are uh, sharing the stage with Echo Voices. For us, I mean, it's the right. only thing we want to be. Um, but I just wanted to mention that. Um, I just wanted to mention that. So, uh, you know, anybody who's joining and watching the recording, it's happening on the same day as inauguration. So, uh, this and, and at the same time. Uh, yes, at the same time. So, you know, we obviously have uh, other things pulling us today, but our conversations about uh, communication have never been so relevant helping everybody to make sure that they have a voice. And so we're here with you, Echo Voices, on Wednesday, uh, the first Echo Voices of the year, uh, in the middle of our second year of bringing Echo Voices. So um, we, if you have signed in, of course, you will receive a um, certificate. Um, handouts are available at the link here. Uh, Terry gave those to us in advance. That's always helpful. And uh, within Zoom, some of the accessibility options, uh, when we consider supports for our kids, access is the first thing that we always make sure of. And, and if we're in the Zoom world, there are options. Um, as we record and post our recording, you will be able to, for any session that happened over the last year, you're going to be able to get a certificate uh, by answering the comprehension quiz. We are going back to previous sessions that were recorded and, and uh, adding comprehension quizzes. Um, but with a staff of 2.4, um, sometimes we are all about the day-to-day. -day, so um, we have big, big visions. I want to always mention the Zoom closed captioning. As you see, it is turned on right now. And uh, the idea of prompts in our PowerPoint is to mention this. And at some point, we may be able to stop mentioning that because it's part of everybody's daily thoughts. Zoom closed captioning is built in. So if you have, uh, particularly here in Oregon, if you have an email that is um, uh, education related, uh, you probably have access to this with, and it's built in. So you can, on your toolbar, you can adjust uh, what your uh, transcript might look like. But this is in beta format, and we are lucky to be part of that. Um, and hopefully it will be available everywhere in the near future. I know ODE are, uh, is now in the Zoom world, but I'm not sure they have access to this yet. But just know that turning it on is, goes way beyond uh, persons with deaf, hard of hearing uh, uh, as their diagnosis. It's, it helps us all. If we need something to focus on, it's there. If we need to make sure that what we heard is what was really said, uh, for the most part, it's accurate. And it really provides a universal design support. So when in doubt, turn it on. Again, Echo Voices, uh, our grant OCAP is through uh, the Oregon Department of Education, has been housed at the lovely downtown uh, Roseburg at uh, the Douglas ESD for more than 30 years. Um, we are part of an ongoing conversation and we invite you to be part of that. So uh, please unmute yourself or share in the chat box. And if you think of something later that you wish you would have said, uh, it's never too late. Uh, to process and come back and share. I'm Deb Fitzgibbons, and it is my pleasure to be here uh, to be a co-facilitator. Uh, I am the coordinator of OTAP and RSOI, support for therapists and anybody who supports kids, really, across the entire state. I am always thrilled to introduce um, my co-facilitator and mentor, uh, Gail Bowser. Uh, Gail, please. Tell us something about you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Gail Bowser. Um, I'm retired, uh, golly, 12 years ago now from Douglas Education Service District where I was a program coordinator. And now I work as an independent consultant with states and programs all over the country. I, my, one of my favorite activities is that I, act as a consultant to um, 
the two ECHO programs that that Deb runs, Echo Voices and Echo Ties, and then also as a consultant to Echo and Assistive Technology at the University of Wyoming. And my friend Terry Wofford is here today as a presenter from that program. It is amazing how the conversations carry over. And, uh, and so we welcome you, whatever your role. Um, I did see a mess, uh, comment about the handouts, and as soon as I introduce our guests and a couple of things, I'm going to go back and, and get that uh, link again and post it in our chat, Rusty. Um, thank you for that. I am, uh, let's see, moving on. Uh, we are working on putting together another uh, amazing uh, combined conference, AT Now and Ties uh, combined to be AT Ties Together. And so that is April 26th through the 28th. And it is virtual, all virtual again this year. And uh, I did put the uh, rates here. We are still putting the conference together and we'll be opening registration uh, by mid-February. Um, we, But I did want you to know what rates you're looking at because we don't want your um, uh, professional dollars to be spent before April. So there you go. Um, we have some of the most amazing uh, presenters who are gonna be coming and I can't wait to share that lineup with you. Um, we also have next Monday, mark your calendar if you've been part of the statewide town hall for therapists. We are doing that again next Monday where uh, you share your ideas. I posted a link here to the join link, but you can also go to, there's going to be a reminder coming out for that. If you're not getting our reminders, please let me know and we'll make sure you're part of that list. But we, um, we ask that you include your uh, questions in advance so we can let our guests um, know what your ideas are, what your uh, burning desires and what the problems of practice are when you get in, uh, you implement the state level guidance in your own world. Whenever you get closer to the student, sometimes those uh, the, the level of decision made in the boardroom doesn't make as much sense. And we're seeing real evidence that people are listening. These are the people who will be with us next time. For those of you who work uh, with kids with um, feeding challenges, note that Marcia Dunn-Klein is going to be with us to talk and do a little breakout. Uh, to talk about uh, feeding and support. So get your questions together and uh, share them. And some real, real change is coming out of these discussions. So we invite you to that. Um, Gail and I are doing a session next week. We had a session that was available that uh, to a schedule change. And we are going to talk about something that maybe you haven't considered before. When we talk about accessible educational materials, where is the intersection with the therapist? We are now putting together a statewide system of access that we hope is consistent from one spot to the other. Everybody has a role in that. And so we're going to be talking about the intersection of your role as therapist and the provision of accessible uh, materials and tools. Deb, I wanted to say about that, um, I had a conversation yesterday about just asking some friends of mine, what is the, the intersection of accessible educational materials and the role of therapists and the group of experts that I was talking to really highlighted how important it was to have the uh, participation of speech and language clinicians not so much in terms of um, disfluent speech, but in terms of the understanding of language and, and kids understand ability to um, understand text when they hear it, um, which is a common and really important component of AIM. So I know there are speech therapists on this call this morning, and I wanted to invite you specially to join us for Echo Ties. Thank you for that. It's really a, a grounding piece, uh, making sure that there's access on every level. And now when we talk about being 
uh, in the virtual world more and working with parents. I think we also need to be considering that what we're doing needs to also be accessible to parents. So again, uh, turn on the uh, closed captioning, even if you are uh, the person you're working with is not a reader. Um, so just some universal things that we're talking about. Thank you for that, Gail. I'm excited about this work. And I saw that Linda Brown is on with us today. And Linda is another pioneer in this area with us and in, in leading our state um, in, a, in, a, in an initiative and in a movement. So Linda, thank you for always being here and thank you for being at the table for these important discussions. Uh, I'm almost giddy uh, with excitement about the possibilities. So as we think about all the pieces that need to come together for uh, getting our student um, prepared for work, whatever that looks like, uh, positioning this course is one of those things that I think is uh, fundamental, making sure that they have the most control. We have a session that by popular demand, we wanted to offer it at our conference last year and it wasn't ready to go virtual, but we have kept with them and now um, it is offered. Um, I'm going to ask Brittany to post all of our um, links into the uh, chat box to, so that people have access. But this is a partnership with Neuro Recovery. And uh, it's interesting. Um, there's a virtual component in a couple of days live. So we pushed until we made it happen for you. So there you go. Uh, it's not just for PTs. It's for teens who uh, know that positioning and these discussions are underlying um, a lot of a lot of supports. Uh, mark your calendar for February 3rd, Wednesday, when our good friend, uh, Dr. Chris Gibbons is going to be talking about some strategies for supporting um, OGCOM at a distance. He is, um, he does represent SmartBox, but as we've talked about many times, um, that doesn't mean that you work for a vendor that all of a sudden you don't have uh, a wealth of knowledge. Dr. Chris Gibbons has so much experience and has worked with uh, OHSU and Pacific and uh, works in the, our state. And so he's going to be sharing with, with us some great ideas and he's a very dynamic speaker. So mark your calendar for February 3rd. Well, meanwhile, back to today. We are thrilled, as we said, uh, Terry is part of the ECHO project. Uh, she is with the Wyoming Institute for uh, Disabilities and the, that is where ECHO in education uh, has its roots right now. So uh, we have a partnership in many ways and uh, Terry is talking to us today about the Assistive Wear Core Word Classroom as a strategy. She's got so many great things that she's done, I think, uh, Gail has highlighted that, but under everything, she's uh, by trade, by license. She is a speech language pathologist who has a wealth of information to share with us today. So I'm going to stop sharing. Terry, I'm going to invite you to start sharing. All right. Thank you so much, Deb. I'm happy to be here today. Yeah, let me go ahead and share my screen here. All right, are you guys seeing that okay? Yes, okay, got, got a thumbs up from Deb, so we're good to go. Yeah, so this morning I wanted to talk to you a little bit about using the Assistive Wear Core Word Classroom as maybe a concept for resources and materials that you may, may consider. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever uh, had the opportunity to use the core word classroom from assistive wear and maybe we can kind of get into that a little bit as we go along. Just a couple of disclosures. So I am employed by the University of Wyoming and I work for the Wyoming Institute for Disabilities. I am by no means a representative for assistive wear. So I um, do not have a relationship with them at all. I have used the core word classroom as an SLP in my private practice and also in a school system in the pr in previous years and also with families. Um, 
in a summer camp setting as well. And I just found it very beneficial. And so I wanted to provide it as maybe a tool that you might put in your toolbox for consideration. Assistive wear, I did reach out to them. I did this session uh, last year for, for our assistive technology group in Wyoming. And I did reach out th to them for permission and was granted permission to share and do screenshots as long as there was no financial benefit from that. So I just wanted to make that absolutely uh, clear on the front end. So as far as learning objectives, what I hope that you'll be able to do by the end of this session is one, know how you can navigate to the assistive wear core word classroom, and then be able to think about three best practices that we use in AAC that were actually used in the development of the assistive wear core word classroom. And then identify at least two resources that we'll talk about today that are in that core word classroom that you could use to support AAC users. So assistive wear, and probably many of you realize this, but they are a vendor and they are a vendor of several different communication apps. So they provide Proloquo to go, they provide SimPod and Proloquo for text. So this is their homepage link here that I've provided you. And it would kind of give you the differences between the different apps that they do provide. Um, on their website, they do have a lot of really great training tutorials as well. So they offer on-demand videos and some of the videos are free in relationship to their apps. Some of them are kind of like a red box rental program so you can rent a video for you know a couple of days or for you know a period of time um, they also have some great blogs that they do for AAC therapists teachers families and also users and then I'm kind of new to using it but um, for the last couple of years I have followed their Facebook page and they really do some great things on their Facebook. Um, Amanda Hartman is a speech language pathologist from Australia. So she not only brings a cool accent to her sessions and her training videos, but she really has some wonderful suggestions and ways that she shares items. So on the Facebook page, sometimes you'll have live sessions with Amanda Hartman. And it's really great to just be able to pop in, kind of get some ideas of different ways that you can implement uh, items using the different apps. So today we are going to talk about the core word classroom and it basically is a collection of resources that was provided by assistive wear and it's really designed to support the implementation of any communication device or app that's based on the concept of core words. So while the materials within the assistive wear core word classroom are off of their vocabulary um, around Proloquo to go, the concepts could be utilized with, again, anything that is going to use that core word uh, approach. So resources um, related to best practices in AAC. So if you go to this link here that I've provided, you'd see different some different concepts would pop up about the development of the assistive wear core word. And it's kind of their blog around the core word classroom. But basically the resources that were provided were provided around several best practices in AAC. The first being that you know we need a robust vocabulary vocabulary system. So we need a combination of core words, but we also need those fringe words and the need for the alphabet for developing those literacy skills. The second best practice that, that is on the website that they talk about is the need for modeling, or you might hear it referred to as aided language stimulation, and really how that needs to occur consistently throughout the day. You 
you know, it doesn't do um, as much good if the individual is only getting it in our direct therapy sessions for speech language pathology, you know, and we're providing it, but really we can multiply the impact that we can have when that modeling is being provided throughout the day. And then the third concept or the best practice is the need for communication to occur everywhere. And how are we going to be able to address that? Um, we know that individuals are generally most successful with AAC when they use a multimodal approach. And so what may fit well in one environment may need to be changed up a little bit in another environment. And so just thinking about that need that communication should be available and should occur in all environments. The materials within the core word classroom are really developed on what they consider the three W's. So the words, the whys, and the ways. So when we think about the words, we think about what core words would we be using within this activity or within this environment. When we think about the whys, we're thinking about why are we communicating, right? We A lot of times we may focus in on those wants and needs, but what, what else is there, right? So the social interaction, getting and giving information, all the different functions of communication. And then the ways, so how do we combine words together when we communicate? And how can we use multimodal communication to be a more effective communicator? So those are how the materials were kind of developed in the core work classroom. This is a free download that you would find on the website, and I really have enjoyed using it throughout the years. Um, you know, it kind of looks at what are the different functions of communication. Um, I've used it in a couple of different ways. I've used it in trainings to kind of get th people thinking beyond just that requesting of items, thinking about all the different reasons that we communicate. I've also used it in looking at individuals specifically and kind of going through and thinking about, yes, this individual, you know, can do a social greeting or they're able to express their feelings, but maybe where are they having a little bit more difficulty? Maybe they're having difficulty changing topics within a conversation. So it can kind of guide you as you're thinking about all of those skills and think about what are the strengths and what are the weaknesses and what areas do I need to consider to look at um, when thinking about developing those communication skills. Um, this is the second part, so it's a two-page document. And on this part, again, thinking about what are those functions. And I really like how they provide it in kind of the categories here. So they provide you with a communicative function. And then what might be core words around that communicative function? And, you know, also thinking about the need for fringe. So what may be some additional fringe words that we might need to model? I also really like the concept of how they think about modeling. And so, you know, a lot of times I hear when we talk about modeling, we're thinking about just the use of modeling those words or that vocabulary, but not just the words, also modeling the communicative function, right? So how do I use those words to be able to communicate, whether it's to ask questions about the activity or to give my opinion? And so really kind of thinking about modeling the communicative function along with that word. Um, so as you navigate into the communication or into the core word classroom, um, you could just go in to this link here and it would send you to a sign up page. Um, so basically all you need to sign up is an email and you develop a password and then they will send you an email and a registration um, link for it as well. You can also sign up using Facebook, Google, and Twitter as well. Um, it is free 
And, you know, like I said, it's, it's just another tool that you might consider. So one of the first, when you get into the landing page, so I have an account, I'm registered as a user. And so when I go into that landing page on the core work classroom, you kind of have different categories. So there are eight different category options. And the first option that pops up is this announcement page that you see here. And within that announcement page, they'll have what are maybe a events or trainings that are coming up. It's also a great place um, for questions. So right within that, if you have a question about something, you can immediately click on a link and, and send an email to ask a question. There are also a list of frequently asked questions that other users have had. And so you could kind of explore that. Maybe you have a question and you're not quite sure exactly how you want to phrase it, but you you look down some of the previously asked questions and you say, oh yeah, this is similar, and you can see the response there. Um, I will say that one thing is that sometimes on the core word classroom, I find that the news about events is not quite as up to date as what it may be within the Facebook account. And so a lot of times the Facebook may have, you know, what's happening in the next couple of days. And that may not get as updated here as quickly, but it still is a great crap category for you to have access to. So another category is the getting started. And so this kind of has what are the concepts around how can I start the implementation using the core word principles? And, you know, all of these that are listed, the different topics, I think there are eight different ones that are listed are options. So you could think about, you know, how to use core word modeling guides, or maybe you're interested in using a core word of the week and developing a planner. Um, so you could tap in into each one of these and it would provide you a quick little uh, PDF document about that topic. Um, so it's kind of a quick, easy way to get you started. The next area is called the core word boards. And I've had an opportunity to use this a lot in the past. And so in this area, what you can do is you can actually have PDF downloads of light tech core word displays. And so these are available in English, Spanish, French, and Dutch. You can also download them and print them in poster size prints. And so, you know, thinking about the need to have communication in different environments. So I've helped school systems use this approach and develop a poster that could be put out on a playground, right, and put behind weatherproofing areas so that it could be utilized. I also use this a lot in my own private summer camp that I did, so I actually would post this on the wall of our arena, and it provided me with a way that I could model on the poster and then the individual might have a low tech board that they were using. And so it again provided them. And, you know, thinking about our high tech devices and our apps, you know, while they're great, it's always really important that we have that backup. So having something when that technology goes down or when we don't have access to it. And I think this is a, is a nice way that you can uh, easily have it available. Terry, I think uh, uh, having that available to emergency providers um, is cool, or, or beyond cool, it's just a good idea. When we talk about emergency plans for our kids, I always think, who needs this? And I'd love to see it on the side of uh, fire trucks. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway. You haven't having something readily available, right? That uh -huh, you know, exactly. may not meet everybody's need, right? And it might not be what they're familiar with, but in in a situation, could it be something that could be helpful and and to be used? Um, the next category is it's called their uh, core word planners. 
and it provides really educational kind of lesson plans around the concept of core words. And so it looks at what might be specific class times or different activities that are happening with cl within classes and how could we use those planners to, to implement core words across the day in the classroom. They also provide a core word modeling guide. And so this kind of helps the team with thinking about what words maybe should I be modeling that matches that language level for the student. So maybe for a beginning user, you might be at the word one word level where you're modeling one word, but maybe for an advanced user, you might be modeling three or four, right? Thinking about expanding language. So this is an example of what it would look like within that area. So it's kind of broken down around what may be happening in the classroom. So around the classroom. So you've got, you know, activities off to the right hand side and some ideas that might be happening. So maybe the classroom is doing a science project or talking about recycling. How could that be incorporated and how could you incorporate core words? I think a lot of times that concept of morning circle, right, especially for our younger users, it's a very common activity that we do. Um, and thinking how can we incorporate those and how can we get students sharing using those core words as well. And then around life skills and of course language and literacy. So thinking about we always need to have access to literacy. How can I develop that? when I'm sharing through books or doing our writing activities, our shared writing maybe kinds of activities. And then, you know, we all learn best when we're doing leisure activities, right? So things that are fun and motivating for the user, how can we incorporate those things and incorporate that vocabulary and make it motivating for that user? And then they provide planner uh, kind of templates that you can use that are word format documents. So maybe you need to tweak something a little bit specifically for your classroom. They kind of give you a nice way that you could go in and look at that. Um, these are also great to share with families. I kind of call them cheat sheets for families. And so I might develop a sheet for a family and here's the core word and here are some concepts and here's some ways that you could incorporate it within the home setting as well. So this is just an example. Of May I ask a question about that work, that sheet? Are you delivering that virtually? That, yeah, that sheet for families? You, okay. You definitely could. You know, you could deliver it virtually. It's just an email attachment. You could. Mm -hmm you know, print it out as a paper item as well if an individual needed that access. So it would be available both ways that you can. And utilize. we talked about the benefit that a year ago, a lot of people might not have um, even been aware of ways that they could join and have virtual schools. So, um, you know, just making things accessible to people virtually, giving them options. Um, you can send that to the family and involvement. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. This is an example of one of those links. So in the previous slide, if we would have clicked on the link in the classroom around the classroom, and this is the science water activity that they have. And so it kind of gives you an idea of what we're doing. So we're going to be doing learning about water and science, right? And so then we're going to think about the words, the whys and the ways. And so they start out on the right hand side of this slide thinking about what might be the different words. And those words are kind of listed by the types of language. 
So verbs describing quantities, prepositions, um, questions, pronouns, conjunction and sequence kinds of words. And then you'll see that they're also color coded. And so the color coding would kind of go along where, where that user is at. Um, the green may be for individuals who are just starting and those early core words that we might be using. Yellow, maybe they're using two and three word combinations. And so this might be some ways to expand with using those words as well. And then the orange, maybe their higher level, their skills are at a higher level. And so now we can begin talking about concepts like, you know, until or, you know, never or always, those, those types of words that we might think might be a little bit higher level as far as concepts. Um, on this, so they continue to talk about the whys and the ways. So the whys, what, you know, what are the reasons to communicate and what are the different ways that we might do that? So again, they divide it out, expressing needs and wants. So maybe we're choosing items within our water activity, or maybe we're wanting to get another person's attention. So what might be some core words that I could target to get that attention? Look, right? Look here look that, right? So all of those kinds of combinations. Getting and giving information. So what would be different kinds of ways that we could combine it? And then thinking about, you know, that social interaction uh, as a reason to communicate, right? Being able to use those uh, concepts related about being polite when we're when we're interacting in the activity, maybe asking for please, can I see it, that type of thing. Um, and, you know, always thinking about we want to model sentences that are longer than the individual is currently using. So thinking about how can we expand um, for developing those skills. Then they also provide information about thinking about grammar, right? So what are the different tenses and how could I utilize the different verb tenses within the activity? So maybe I have ice and it's cold, but it changes. And then, you know, what kinds of verbs could I use around that? Um, they also provide a lot of extension activities or ideas that you might do. So things like setting up a water table, right? And how could I incorporate um, core words within that? Talking about maybe filling containers more and less water and adding to it. Um, using colored, you know, different colors with the water. So lots of different ways that I think that they provide here. Um, it kind of brings back a fond memory of a water activity that we did one time was soap boat races. So everybody getting different sizes of soap and developing a mask and we're racing our our boats in a little pool of water during a summer camp activity. They also provide some really great literacy suggestions. So thinking about how could I use this right in predictable chart writing. So maybe if you're talking about the water and you're adding different colors, you know, it changed to pink or it changed to green, right? Thinking about ways that you could use a kind of those uh, carrier sentences and then what words in addition. Um, also thinking about, you know, the need to continue to use the alphabet in other ways. So, you know, maybe alphabet plastic letters within the water and as you pour it, which, which letter comes out, right? Oh, this letter is B, it makes this sound, right? The B is B and thinking about how could you extend it. And then they give you some great um, suggestions right around science related to books for reading. So going back to Tar Heel Reader and activities within, within that. And so they'll list out what are some different books that I might be able to incorporate either in shared reading or maybe in your independent reading activities that would 
kind of promote and continue that activity. Um, this is kind of that when I showed you the uh, chart that had the different colors. So this kind of explains it in a little bit more detail. So that green is just starting out. Yellow is I want to model maybe three to six word sentences. And orange is maybe I'm producing three to six words. But maybe now I want to increase my concepts and my language concepts. So maybe join joining ideas together and how could I incorporate that? Carrie, this color coding that you're talking about is not related, related to other color coding schemes, right? It's just color coding within this program. Correct. Yeah, just their, their concept of providing it. Thank you. <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry, I got a little tickle there for a second. Uh, the core word of the week planner, like I said, it, it allows you to do it across the across activities and throughout the day. Um, and so they have the weekly display. So you could have a core word of the week and you could do a display of that. And so this is an example. So maybe my core, to, core word of the week is like, and what are some different ways, again, that communicative function that I could use that core word. So you can see I could use it for social interaction. I could use it for getting and giving information or expressing my wants and needs. Along with that, you know, you it's great to have that core word, but you need to know where that core word is at right on that display. <clears throat> and so they may do something like have the word display and then it will circle. Where is that word at? Right. So this can be really beneficial when you're working with communication partners who are new to using a system and that may be teachers or pairs or maybe you have a substitute in the classroom and so that they can be able to find it. It's also a great tool that you can use with families. So helping them to develop their skills as they're going along um, and knowing where those words might be. So the next category is a five minute filler. And these are great little activities. I know you all have had those kids that you have an activity planned and it's supposed to last 15 to 20 minutes and they're the first one finished, right? And ready to move on to something else. And so I think about these are quick little reference sheets that you could do on the fly. And so here's what it might look like. So you have five minutes and you have bubbles. So what could you do? Here are core words that you could use and ways that you could implement those within that activity. They also carried it one step further to kind of give a little example of what a school library in Australia did. And I really love this suggestion. So they went through and they made, they use these five minute fillers and they did Ziploc bags. And they put the items right within that Ziploc bag. So this one is around dressing up. So they've got mask and different things that you might use for dress up activities. And then they've got their board and they've got the concept of what would be the core words. So again, it could be something that you could easily pull. I utilize this a lot in my camp activities as well. So this concept was really beneficial. Thinking about when a kid is done, they tend to sometimes get into things, into trouble. And so keeping them busy in an activity is a good thing. Um, and, and how can you do that in a fun way? And so pulling those. And I love the idea of the library providing it so that teachers could check them out, they could return them, they could, you know, explore different options. Maybe when they got tired of one, uh, you know, activity or filler, they could go back and, and utilize something different. 
And then the next category is core words at home. And so a lot of times I hear parents, you know, I've had worked with parents and that's great. I, I'm just not sure how I can incorporate it in the home setting. And so kind of giving parents a quick little reference sheet that would allow you to think about how could I do this? So I picked the bedtime as the example here. You know, I think it's something that hopefully all kids are doing at some point at home, we as parents at least want to make sure that that's happening. And so what could be some core words around that core, you know, bedtime routine that I could incorporate? Um, so again, I think it's really easily. And you know, if you think that this is too much for a parent, you could always adapt it. So sometimes for parents, you know, I might just mark through or I might highlight specific ones that we're, we're wanting to work on. So I might go through with a highlighter and say, pay particular attention to the yellow, right? And allow them to really focus in. And then maybe in a couple of weeks, we're paying really particular attention to a different group on this. So again, it provides an easy way to kind of share that information. And then the last one is just kind of resources and strategies. And again, um, just has a lot of resources around core words, modeling, uh, pro the quo to go information. So maybe, maybe you want to set up a schedule within that app. It could walk you through how you could do that. Um, references, so research articles and references are there. And then ways to think about descriptive teaching. So, you know, while a lot of times we may be asked to add vocabulary around certain teaching activities that take place, what might be descriptive teaching ways we could use as alternatives from constantly adding vocabulary that may not be used a lot. So one that comes to mind is thinking about maybe the Statue of Liberty, right? How frequently throughout my lifetime am I going to talk about the Statue of Liberty? Well, that may be an individual concept, right? It may be if you live close and it's someplace that you want to visit, that may be talked about more frequently. But if it's going to be used for a short teaching you know, opportunity in a classroom, what would be other ways that you could describe that? You know, tall, girl, freedom, free, those kinds of things. So thinking about that. And then thinking about that literacy, right? So teaching to all and having opportunities for literacy. Yeah. So I'm going to stop share. I did provide at the very end for you guys the resources here. And then, like I said, also take a look at the Facebook page because I think it is a valuable resource as well. And um, I'll open it up for questions or comments. Well, Terry, I'm going to start with an observation um, that, you know, I know that we're focused on uh, activities for uh, kids, particularly who might be using communication devices and complex communicators. But what you have shared with us is really a strategy of building in uh, supports for that child within activities that can be used for everybody. And so a lot of times people will start with an activity and then when it comes to, oh, I didn't consider how this might happen. If we start saying, this is how we can include that student, then it's universal and it includes, includes everybody. So it's in the design, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. And, and you know, one of the things I think about is if a lot of times, if you can give me an example, I can run with it. But sometimes I need that example on the front end to kind of generate and provide me with some, you know, direction as to how I can incorporate this. And, you know, by no means is this an inclusive curriculum of anything, but I think it does a really nice job of getting you to think about it and what are the different ways. And I like that it can be used 
regardless really of the communication app, the concept is the same. You know, I've done things. So in the past, I used uh, the language acquisition through motor planning or LAMP app, right? And then I had a student move in who was using Proloquo and they were both in the same classroom and the teacher was going, I'm just not sure. So um, I might use that core word of the week and I would show her here it is in Proloquo to go and on the back side here it is in LAMP. Right. So I know how to model it both places, because let's be perfectly honest, you know, when you don't use something, you lose it. Right. So even for me, you know, I'm not doing one on one therapy as much. And when I go to model, I'm like, oh, where was that word? You know, oh, here it is. Yeah. And after I have it a couple of times, then I don't need that cheat sheet as much but it can't be really beneficial in the beginning. And everybody has these skills. And you know, going back to where we first started with Echo Voices, you do. You may not have had a lot of uh, practice with um, the OGCOM piece of uh, language, but you've got the skills and it's just taking a bit of time. And tech is intimidating. It can be. So like you said, just giving a little example to have something in my memory bank, it really goes a long way to taking the mystery away of this, this can be just a supplement to everyday life. You know, I was thinking a similar thing, um, particularly as you were talking about uh, talking in that last section, that one of the ways that the role of uh, SLPs particularly has changed, uh, particularly those who work with kids with complex communication needs, is that we have had to be better um, coaches and, and really provide supports to teachers. And I think a lot of the stuff that you showed today is so readily accessible to to SLPs, but if I could point a teacher in that direction, um, I think that's a, vir you know, there's a lot as a virtual curriculum that um, could be used in those classrooms for our kids with, with complex communication needs. So I had never, I was familiar with the core words classroom, but I'd never thought of it in that particular way. And I think that's a, mm -hmm. a real asset. I can pull stuff off that site and, and work with a teacher on it and then talk about what her units are this month or whatever and, and really get a lot done that way. So yeah, thank you Gail, for putting I, that up. Yeah, Gail, I would agree. And I think not only teachers, but parents right so i can i can get parents over to the facebook page and they can join a session with amanda hartman and she's sharing a book and she's doing the work but they're sitting there with their child and they can be interacting and seeing and learning at the same time uh -huh. and so i think that is a great way to virtually be able to access materials that maybe sometimes was harder in the past mm -hmm. And we could all be in the same room. Exactly. I mean, that, that's a wonderful asset. So we can uh, mentor and model and do all kinds of things together. Yeah, great. And Gail, I see you said, is there a cost? There is no cost. It is free. It was developed as a pilot project. And um, like I said, you know, it's, it's not going to have everything, but it gives you a jumping off point and a way to think about it. Yeah. And, you know, people oh, I have been creating that. your own curriculum and, um, you know, is it is it accessible? Uh, you know, these are the conversations that we're having. But if somebody is searching for something, uh, just knowing that it's there and getting the word to people is always the challenge. But this is a great resource to put some uh, framework around uh, hybrid classroom. Mm -hmm more it's about the environment where am i i can use the same things when this child is at home right uh, did you want me to share the case that... yes let's go ahead with that because okay. it is a crucial piece of uh, what we talk about applying it to a student so i know schedules are kind of crazy but we do want to talk about a particular application so uh, share a student with us all right let me see here 
All right. So um, just in thinking about it, let me get the slideshow here from the beginning. Um, so this was a student, um, and I'm sure many of you have worked with students like this in the past, maybe thinking about your caseload. So a six-year-old male kindergarten student diagnosis of autism and sensory processing disorder, speech language delay, reserves, SLP services, two times a week for 30 minutes and OT one time a week for 30 minutes. He is an only child and is, has a very supportive family unit, has a cousin that attends uh, kindergarten in a general ed classroom and they, they um, have a, a special bond there and a relationship. He enjoys activities with lots of movement, so he's definitely a kid on the go, bouncing, swinging, sitting, and spinning, and he loves dinosaurs. Gross motor skills are appropriate for his age, but those fine motor skills, he tends to avoid pencil to paper and the writing task. Behavior is generally appropriate with a first then approach and a tangible reinforcement schedule. And um, let's see, sensory breaks. All right, so his educational environment, he participates in a special ed classroom. And in this classroom, it's kind of a multi-level age range. It's a very rural area. Um, so, you know, they kind of grow grouped uh, age ranges together. Um, and he's in that classroom um, for all of his academics. There's a total of six students in the classroom. And there's one full-time teacher and two pairs. And the pairs support those activities, both within the classrooms and then as students trans uh, transition to other activities. He attends specials like PE, art and music, recess and lunch with the general ed classroom with paraprofessional support. Identifies letters of the alphabet from a field of five with 80% accuracy. And the first uh, has the first 10 or, or I should say has 10 of the first 50 sight words. And his number accuracy is identifying the numbers one through 10 with about 70% accuracy. As far as writing his first name, there are five letters in his first name and he's able to write two of them legibly on a good day. Um, so thinking about those skills. As far as communication strategies, he communicates using gestures. So maybe pointing to things or taking a person to something, adapted sign, he'll clap to indicate more, uses vocalizations, sounds to express pleasure and displeasure, body language. So he'll do this to mean go you know, an up and down movement to mean go. His verbal expressions are limited. He um, has about three or four words. So go, no, on. And that is generally understood by familiar partners um, within the context of the environment. His speech is not 100% accurate. Um, it seems like there may be some phonological processing. So go is produced more like do. Um, and final weak uh, sounds on the, on the ends of words. So final consonant sounds. The parent had attempted PECS at an earlier age as a preschooler, and he was successful being able to use I want and then pick a preferred item um, within the home. They have since uh, discontinued use because they found it was very hard to um, transition across and throughout with him because he is so active and so on the move and they had a hard time keeping up with the PECS picture symbols. Um, the SLP has completed an AAC assessment and recommended the speech generating device uh, with Proloquo to go in a seven by 11 grid size and immediate core vocabulary. 
And um, the goal or the primary area of concern has been that the, the student has primarily been using the speech sharing device and app within the individualized therapy sessions with the SLP and the students had good progress. But now we're really wanting to transition beyond just that therapy setting. So thinking about implementing with the student across environments and partners, um, because there's really a need to move beyond that simple choice making activities. Barriers, um, the teachers and the parents have concerns that the speech generating device may get broken, right? The student's very active, he's on the move and he's going all, you know, throughout the day. The teachers and the parents are unfamiliar with using the speech generating device in the app. And there's a concern that the app might be too complex for the student at this time. The team hasn't developed a plan for the implementation um, of the speech sharing device. And there's also another student in the classroom who has more severe behaviors, especially around technology, and can become very possessive of others' devices. And if you know not given access to it, may pitch it and and they're, they're concerned about breakage in that aspect. So not only from the user, but from peers within that setting. So that's kind of my case. And, and I'd love to open it back up for some discussion. You who have been in these scenarios, and we'll be in them again. What are your thoughts? When I see you saying, oh, Rusty, go ahead. Oh, he's thanking us for the valuable information. Rusty mm -hmm. is a frequent flyer with us. Uh, people are um, uh, having to go and, and go do other things. Rusty, I love your background. Um, and so whoever in, is uh, left with us and thinking and sharing thoughts. One of my thoughts that you said is that they're not sure if the program is um, the right level for him, if they've made the right choice. And so I'm not sure what the solution is right now, but it is a reminder that everybody needs to be at the table and talking about a feature match before you buy something. And so, you know, there's so many pe so many things we could talk about just there. Yeah. Rusty, in your practice, are you working um, with kids um, and helping to decide what tools they're going to use? Or is that something that you typically come in and something's decided and you have to make it work? Yeah, it's uh, in all situations, every classroom and in school and school, to, you know, is a little bit different. And so you're coming in and trying to just tweak a little bit because everybody, you know, you want to encourage them to do their own personality and their own style. Um, and so this type of information really helps when you go into a classroom and they've been, you know, working with a student that they kind of get stuck with and they're not knowing what to do next. And, Sometimes, it, you know, you have opportunities to share, hey, have you looked into this or tried this? And um, we have a really good um, speech uh, therapy team, and they are, you know, really up to date on a lot of stuff. So sometimes we'll go to them and, and find out information from them to be able to, to help with the students. But um, I did a class training on students with deaf blindness and this information that you're providing um, is just really invaluable to the developing of routines and the consistency that is so needed to make sure that they can, don't get confused that they're able to continue and just by developing the basics and, and like when you were sharing the the rocking up and down and how that was their way to say you know i need to go you know, they may even have smaller, um, little tiny 
things that they do that you have to really pay close attention to, to, to see what they're acknowledging. But I really love the information this morning. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. And that was a, another observation, not necessarily a question, but I, uh, when we think about um, those materials and the application for everybody, whether it's in a classroom or whether it's an online session, um, I think that's one of the great pieces is that I could print this out and hand it to a teacher's uh, assistant, a paraprofessional. I could hand it to anybody and it could be an activity. Once the structure of what I'm supposed to do is known, then anybody could implement that. And you know, when we think about building and developing language, isn't language underneath a lot of our disability categories, regardless of what they are? And so helping people to have a solid understanding of those words is crucial. So thank you for that, Rusty. What are you other know, people thinking? Go ahead, Gail. As I, um, I seem to have my teacher hat on today. So um, I am a teacher by training. I get to work with a lot of other uh, related service providers. But a lot of the things that you talked about, Terry, in this particular case, especially that last slide about the goal, made me think about classroom management strategies. So one of the things that good teachers know how to do is develop regular routines and then they teach kids the routines so that they know what they're expected to do um, and one of the things about language that can be sort of um, difficult is you we don't have routines of language so it's how do you manage the device how do you allow for varied conversations and things like that so that would be one of the things that I would recommend to this teacher as she began to began to implement is pick, you know, what's the, the time of day when you think this device would be the most useful? What are the rules about how that device is used and when it's used and who can touch it? Mm -hmm. um, so to involve the whole classroom in that conversation. Um, and the other thing that came to mind in my role as a consultant is I'd want to be doing a lot of coaching. Um, you've got a device, you've got a, a system in place, you know a lot about his vocabulary. So it's really the adults in his environment, whether it's a teacher or a parent, who need the most support at this point in time to yeah, help him follow those routines. And coaching, uh, and the second point I think on that list of barriers was about the parent and their lack of knowledge about it. Yeah. So, you know, even from the beginning, you know, oftentimes we think that the parent doesn't have a role, but begin in bringing them into the training at every level. So, you know, I heard you talking about the why and some of those the pieces tie in the why. We understand the why if we're part of the big picture discussions a lot better. So bringing parents into those uh, conversations, we have to. Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, that that this is a case that I've kind of consulted in on. And so kind of helping them to think about. And um, if I could do just a quick share screen, I'll share with you as well. Um, kind of what, you know, when when I worked with this case, what might be a couple of things that they might consider to help with that implementation piece and definitely training of, um, you know, the parties involved was really important. And as far as I'm concerned needs to be, you know, part of that implementation plan. And so how am I gonna train those partners? And so can I use things that we've talked about this morning in with those training activities? Do I need to develop specific trainings for those parents? Um, and then thinking about, you know, we wanna presume competency. So that SLP did the assessment and in this case, they, they, it was a team approach and the team was included and they were in, in, 
included in the recommendation for the device. And so then thinking about, okay, what might I need to do to be able to tweak things a little bit as I start out, right? So even just using, and I'm gonna hold it up here. <laughs> this is a seat clamp. And sometimes I've used something, you know, just like this sleek clamp to kind of provide a mounting unit onto a student's desktop so that it's there. If another student happens to come by whenever that teacher's eyes are off and tries to grab it, it's not going to get immediately picked up and thrown while my back is turned, right? They might be trying to get it loose, but they really can't. And then I think about the importance of partners supporting the communication. So this student may not be at the point where he's going to be carrying his device with him at all times throughout the day, but he has a peer support that goes with him throughout the day, right? Can we have that communication partner initially be the responsible party and they have it available, right? So then the, if a communication need is there, he knows that he can go to that device and he can interact. And then we build up over time to where he develops those skills with independence with carrying it. Other things that I considered and, and you know, looking at the setup of Proliquo to go. So this is where um, an app setup can really uh, kind of guide um, the implementation. And so, you know, with the seven by 11 format there, that's a lot of messages at one time, right? So maybe what I need to go in is think about using what they call progressive language. So I might start out with, they have seven or six, six or seven different steps, I think here, but it limits the number of buttons or messages or vocabulary that's within the system. And so that that way, it's not overwhelming, right? It's not overwhelming for the partners to learn where things are at. Now I can a little bit more readily find where that go button is. So maybe when he's doing this and, you know, it works well if you know what that means, but what's another socially appropriate way to say it? I could model it here. So sometimes I think even just thinking about the setup of the vocabulary, and of course, we don't want to see it left like this forever, right? But can I start out and reduce the cognitive demand maybe by the user and also the communication partners as I'm learning the system, right, to make things a little bit easier. Um, so that's just one way that I did. And, and you know, um, again, thinking about looking at this page versus all of those items. So you can also go in and kind of do what they call hide or dim items. So this is an example of how you might be able to edit screens with doing that. And so I think that sometimes we kind of feel it's an all or none approach with the app when maybe really what we need to look at is how can we tweak it just a little bit to help that individual be more um, successful with the use of it. And then over time, of course, we're going to make more and more vocabulary visible, right? But if I overwhelm everybody in the beginning, I may not get to my end goal of having, um, you know, the individual be successful and as well the partners, right? So thinking about kind of bringing everybody along slowly <laughs> and using. So if we're doing a feature match of what we want to do, we know that we want to go just a step beyond because we want to have the ability yes. to push somebody, but we also want to know that we want a prod, a program, an app, whatever, that has the potential to grow, but also has the potential for us to take it down to bare bones so we can start there. Absolutely. Yeah. So anyway. You know, I okay. work as a consultant to a bunch of different programs, and one of my best pieces of advice ever is always, you need baby steps. So this is a perfect example, I think, of 
it may even be that the child can handle more vocabulary than you <laughs> than we saw on that demonstration screen, but that the adults in the environment may need may just by that. getting the structures, just by getting the structures takes away that cognitive demand. And you know, now I know what I'm going to expect. Now my brain is open mm -hmm. for learning. So much good stuff that you shared with us today. Well, thank you guys. That's all I have. I don't know if anybody has any other okay. questions, but. Okay, fine. well, we uh, are processing and you've given us great things to think about and things to take away and use yeah. immediately and to be sharing with team. So those conversations you're in, get excited about what you've learned and share it with others because that's how teams form and that's how ideas are shared and that's how education improves. And so thank you all for being here. Thank you for the tough roles that you're all doing right now on a day when you could have chosen to have a more national um, event. We are thrilled that you chose to be here with us. And uh, we will look forward to seeing you again next time. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.